class, welcome back to World History 2. I hope everyone is doing well today. In today's lecture, we're going to begin our two-part series on the rise of the Nazis, this lecture and the next lecture. We'll be looking at the rise of Adolf Hitler and how he came to power, and then also the rise of the Nazi state. And uh, like I did before, I'd like to show you a few books from my bookshelf uh, to show you what, uh, what I've used in the past and just a couple of books. Uh, but the first book I want to show you is called The Year That Made Hitler, 1924 by Range. And uh, this is a very important book that shows uh, exactly what takes place in Hitler's life to where he comes to power. It's a very critical year uh, for Adolf Hitler in regards to his planning to become uh, the Nazi leader. And then the second one is called A History of Nazi Germany by Bendersky. Uh, this is a, a short read, it's not very long, but it's a good compact uh, history of how uh, the Nazi state was developed. In regards to Hitler himself, there is a two volume set by Ian Kershaw called uh, Hitler Hubris, which is 1889 to 1936, and then Hitler Nemesis, 1936 to 1945. And these books, it's, it's probably the best set I've ever read uh, on Adolf Hitler. I've read this one uh, three times. I've read this uh, series. Uh, it's, a, it's a good look at uh, almost every aspect of his life. And uh, when you, especially when you get into the rise of the Nazis and uh, the World War II, uh, it's just very detailed and really uh, dives into what Hitler was thinking. And then one aspect that we do look at in regards to the rise of the Nazi state is how uh, ordinary Germans could go along with what was taking place in the Third Reich. And uh, one of the books that I would recommend in regards to uh, those interested in the Holocaust is uh, called Hitler's Willing Executioners, Ordinary Germans and the Holocaust by Goldenhagen. Uh, this is a, um, a book dealing with uh, the police state that was recruited to follow the armies into the areas that had a lot of Jewish population, and they executed Jews uh, really kind of before the concentration camp system started up. Uh, the uh, willing executioners went through and massacred the Jews, and this is a really good um, book on that topic. However, this book is um, kind of a, a heavier read. It's not, not very easy to read because it's uh, written at a higher level. And then also, one thing that Hitler believed in was that if, if you were able to get the youth, you could then indoctrinate them into uh, what you wanted, especially in regards to the military. And uh, the Hitler Youth was a, a thriving organization uh, from the 1930s all the way up until the end of the war. And uh, two books that I have are just called the HJ. It means Hitler Jugend, which means uh, Hitler Youth. And it's a two volume set uh, by Angolia. And it, it's uh, just a, a look at the, the different aspects of the Hitler Youth. Lots of pictures in it, lots of uh, what, what it would look like, the artifacts, um, the different things they would wear on uniforms, uh, the structure, all of that. Uh, this, this wasn't a cheap set. I think these were $80 a piece. It's just a really good look at the Hitler Youth and how uh, these uh, young men and women um, grew up in the Hitler Youth and uh, became uh, servants of the Nazi state. So that's, uh, that's the HJ. And there's many, many other books out there. Uh, that you can uh, research and look at. But those are just a couple from my bookshelf. So in this PowerPoint, we'll be looking at the rise of the Nazis, part one. Stay tuned. Okay, class, we're going to have our first PowerPoint lecture on uh, the rise of the Nazis, uh, part one. Obviously, you can't talk about the Nazis, the Third Reich, World War II, Germany, all of that without talking about Adolf Hitler. And there's just uh, two pictures of Adolf Hitler, one as a, a young man uh, in power, um, of the Nazi party, and then the second one is after he has become the Fuhrer of Nazi Germany. Okay, so we're going to talk about Adolf Hitler and uh, majority majority of this PowerPoint. You see the dates of his birth and death, 1889 to 1945, uh, born April 10th, uh, 1889, in Braunau am Inn, which is in Austria. He was not born in Germany, he was born in Austria, but when Germany annexed Austria before World War II, it just basically became part of the Greater Third Reich. For the record, he was born in Austria, fourth of six, of six children. Um, most of those children died either in infancy or as very, very young children. Uh, only um, he had a brother that lived till he was about six years old. He was actually close to his brother, uh, but... And that six-year-old brother died, and then he did have a sister that lived until 1960. He did have uh, other siblings, but when you think about how Hitler survived um, and his other brothers or his sisters did not, uh, how Hitler survived World War I when millions of people did not, 
uh, you know, he would go on to uh, to do some horrific things in the 20th century. So he had uh, mom and dad. Uh, dad was Alois. Mom was Clara. Uh, he clashed with his authoritarian father, Alois. Uh, dad was a uh, customs official, and he died in 1903 of a lung hemorrhage. So Adolf was not very old uh, when he, he died. He was a young teenager. He deeply loved his mother, Clara Hitler. Mom died in 1907 of breast cancer, and this was a big blow uh, to Hitler. He loved her very much, and so he was uh, 18 years old uh, when mom died. He loved art as a boy, and he wanted to be an artist, but his father, Alois, disapproved of him being an artist, and he really wasn't a very good student uh, in school. So on the left is Alois, very stern-looking man. Uh, there you see his his dates, 1837-1903. And on the right is Clara, Hitler, 1860-1907. to 1907. Uh, Quite a bit older. There's a 23-year age difference between Alois and Clara. Uh, Alois was married before and had other children and all of that, uh, but his wives passed away. Uh, Clara was actually a housekeeper in the home, and after uh, Alois's wife had died, he ended up marrying Clara. But she was uh, significantly younger than him. Okay, there's uh, baby Adolf Hitler there on the left. Looks like a curious, inquisitive child. Uh, but then Hitler in school, up there in the center of the picture, I circled it for you there. There's Adolf Hitler in the center of the picture with his arms crossed. He did not like school. Here's the family tree of Hitler, and uh, if you want to pause the video and look at this in more detail, you can. But I just want to just point out, uh, I got the cursor here. The family tree up here is kind of interesting. So here's, here's Hitler in the square, and then here's mom, Clara. I'm underlining her name with my cursor. And then over here is dad, Alois. Okay, notice what his name is here. His name is Alois Schickelgruber. And later that will become Hitler because there's some odd things that go on in, in, the, in the naming here. You see it's, his name is Heidler and then Hootler and Heidler over here. Okay, so Johann Heidler and Johann Napumuk Hootler are are uh, siblings, but their name is different because of the way it was written down in the registry of the town, uh, in the in the record keeping of the town. And then this this one here ended up uh, taking care of Alois, and Alois then took the name Hitler because it was misspelled in the record record book. Uh, but the point is, what the, what I, the reason I'm telling you this is because if his name was not changed to later to be Hitler, Alois Schickelgruber would have been the father of Adolf Schickelgruber. But because he took the, uh, I guess that would be the one of the uncle's last names, so it would be his brother, so his uncle's last name, he took that name, Hitler, um, so that's how Hitler got his last name. I think it'll be a completely different, uh, a different world we live in if uh, if people had to say "Hail Schickelgruber" instead of "Hail Hitler." So, just uh, an interesting note about the name. Also, what's interesting in this family tree is if you see Alois here, he was married over here to Franziska, but she had died. She died in 1884. Okay. Uh, he would remarry Clara in 1885, but she dies in 1884. Well, there were children here, and down here you have Angela Hitler, who lived till 1949. She married Leo Rabal. Well, they had a child, some children down here. Well, down here is Angela Gelly Rabal, and notice she died in 1931 from suicide. Now, in Hitler's... Um, personal relationship he he kind of like had a crush on Angela and or Gelly is what he called her and um, there was some kind of a, a love interest going on between Adolf and and Angela Gelly 
but she ended up killing herself in 1931, which which really um, affected uh, Hitler. So anyway, just um, go. Here's Edmund. Uh, he died in 1900. So Adolf was 11 years old when Edmund died. Edmund was six when he died. Um, Adolf was 11. So these two were very close, and he ended up dying. Uh, here's Paula. She lived till 1960. Um, that's just uh, for your interest. Okay, so Vienna life. After his early life, uh, Vienna life. He moved to Vienna, Austria, and he wanted to enter the Ac Academy of Fine Arts uh, to be trained as a painter. But when he applied, he actually applied twice, and both times he was rejected, and both times the reason was that he could not paint people or portraits. He was a very good landscape painter, but not people or portraits, so he was rejected twice. Again, what difference, we don't want to live, uh, relive history in hypotheticals, but what difference it would have been uh, if, if he did end up going to that school? Would he have had a different direction in life where he would not have become the leader of Germany? He was a, a homeless drifter in Vienna, lived in uh, some flop houses. Those are like kind of like men's dormitories for people that are homeless called flop houses and he basically painted postcards uh, to earn money and that's that's basically how he made his living his meager meager living by painting some postcards uh, during this time he fell in love with Wagner's music there would be outdoor uh, concerts that people could go listen to or or cheap concerts to get into and Wagner was very popular so that's um, Valkyrie is one of the Wagner's songs uh, the flight of the bumblebee is another one of Wagner's. So uh, during this time, Hitler developed uh, anti-Semitic beliefs. Uh, Vienna was very anti-Semitic. Um, there was a lot of people going around and just doing their preaching on the street corners of anti-Semitism, and they would have little pamphlets to hand out. And so Hitler um, would read these pamphlets, and he, this is where his anti-Semitic beliefs really began to uh, begin. So really, during this time of his life, he was a non-entity. In fact, several years of this time period, people don't even know what was going on. Historians don't even know what was going on with Adolf Hitler at this time. He was just a non-entity. So when I said that he was a painter, um, here's a, here are some paintings by Hitler. You look at this, and it's like, wow, he's a really good painter. I mean, I can't imagine sitting down and painting these uh, uh, different mediums. This one up on the upper right was watercolor. Uh, but... You can tell he, he does not have, you know, these are basic figures. And you might say, well, that's pretty good, a pretty good painting of a figure. But to get into the school, you had to be a better figure painter or portrait painter. But yeah, the, the, this is very good paintings, I think. You know, for the average person to sit down and paint like this, you, you wouldn't be able to do it. But he had he had good perspective and and all of that. But he just wasn't good enough to get into the school. But clearly he was a good painter. Okay, World War One. Basically, as a failed drifter and, a, and his painting career never took off, Hitler joined the army in August 1914. He wanted to avoid the Austrian army uh, because he did not like the Habsburgs. Uh, so what he did was he moved to Munich, Germany, and in Munich he ended up joining the 16th Bavarian Reserve Infantry. In the war, he was a front-line dispatch runner, uh, which was a very dangerous job, and he did that for four years. Uh, a dispatch runner is somebody that would be uh, running messages back and forth from the front line trench to the um, maybe to the command trench or to a reserve trench. He'd be running back and forth, getting messages back and forth between commanders and field commanders. Recently, the movie 1917 ha was released, and uh, that's about um, a dispatch runner who has to run and get a message to. Uh, to the front lines so he's a dispatch runner very dangerous again he you know he could have been killed any second but he he, he was not so we see here on the bottom of the screen the battles that he fought in he fir fought in the first battle of Ypres uh, Belgium that was early in the war uh, then he also fought in the battle of the Somme where he was wounded in 1916 uh, he fought in uh, the Battle of Arras. Okay, um, we have one more battle to go, but uh, here uh, is Adolf right here on the far right. 
And this is a picture of other dispatch runners. This is his unit. And so here he is on the far right. You can kind of see their uniforms for World War. Uh, those are German uniforms for World War One. Uh, he fat, uh, fought in the Battle of Passchendaele towards the end of the war. Again, he was wounded in October 1916, the Battle of the Somme. He was awarded the Iron Cross First Class for bravery, uh, which was kind of rare <clears throat> because he he didn't advance very far in rank. He, the highest rank he attained was corporal when the war ended was a corporal. And so for being in the war for four years and outliving all these other people, you would think that he would have moved up in rank very uh, quickly, but he did not. But the Iron Cross First Class is kind of rare for a corporal to get. So, because there's different classes of the Iron Cross, and so First Class is a very high award. 1918, he was temporarily blinded by mustard gas, and he was in the hospital when the war ended, uh, recovering from this mustard gas attack, and he heard that Germany lost the war, and in Mein Kampf, his book, he says that he just wept and wept in his pillow, hearing that um, Germany had lost he finished the war as a corporal, as I mentioned, uh, not promoted higher because his superiors said he lacked leadership potential. So you have World War I commander saying Corporal Hitler lacked leadership potential and Corporal Hitler was going to go on to be the Fuhrer of Germany and cause all kinds of havoc in Europe. Okay, so now uh, rise of the Nazis, 1919 to 1933, that's the time period of the rise of the Nazis because the Nazi party basically becomes uh, <clears throat> the leader of Germany in 1933 uh, when Adolf becomes chancellor and then president and then Fuhrer. Uh, but when it started off, it was the German Workers' Party. And so basically, how did Hitler get involved with this? After the war, Hitler remained in the army as a political agent. And what that means is after the war, a lot of little groups began to pop up and began to preach their uh, political standings, their political ideologies, and so uh, the military wanted to keep an eye on what was going on with these different groups, and there was everything from far-right groups to far-left groups, and so they wanted to keep an eye on these things. So they had army, basically agents, go and infiltrate these groups, and Hitler was one of them. So his job was to infiltrate the political meetings of the German Workers' Party and to report their activities back to the army. May to June 1919, he spied, that, that word there, right here's a typo, that's supposed to be spied, S-P. Okay, uh, he spied on the German Workers' Party, man, I'm, I have all kinds of typos. He spied on them, and they, they basically would then morph into the Nazis. But he liked what they had to say, and so instead of spying on them and reporting back their activities, he ended up joining the German Workers' Party in September of 1919. And he was put in charge of their propaganda um, branch. So basically, Hitler was supposed to spy on them, report back. Instead, he liked what they said. He joined them. And because it was a small party, and it was also kind of, uh, it was, it was um, local, uh, localized in Munich, Bavaria, Germany. Munich is the city. Bavaria is the state of Germany. And so they... Um, were, were localized there, kind of small, so him joining and being put in charge of the propaganda was not a, a big deal. Uh, Hitler was not the first member of the Nazi party. Um, he joined the party. But in 1920, the party was named to this long name here on the bottom of the, of the PowerPoint. National Socialistische Deutsche Arbeiterpartei. And what that means is the National Socialist German Workers Party, and for short, they were called Nazis from the two highlighted sections there on the name. Okay, they were called Nazis. National Socialist German Workers Party. It sounds like it would be a left-wing party, me saying socialist and workers, uh, but it was not. It was a far right-wing party. They fought against communists. They fought against socialists. Okay, so that's the name of their party. Becomes the Nazis. So we'll talk now about the early Nazi party. Uh, in, during this time period, 1919 to 19, 
basically uh, 23, uh, the climate was ripe for party development and growth. And the reason being was that there was a very poor economy in Germany, which we've talked about in the past, PowerPoints. Uh, there was resentment of the loss of World War I. There was the hated Treaty of Versailles, overall discontent among the people in Germany. Uh, the early Nazi party was centered in Bavaria, which disliked the democratic government in Berlin. Okay, so remember during that time period, 1919 and 1933 was the Weimar Republic or the Weimar German government. And uh, this area in Bavaria could not stand that government. Uh, Bavaria was a center point for right-wing Freikorps groups. And I remember the Freikorps was, uh, uh, they, were, they were groups that would, um, organize kind of militarily around a political idea. And so many of them were right-wing groups. Many of them ended up joining the Nazi party. But the Freikorps was uh, mostly were World War I veterans that refused or had difficulty returning to civilian life. Many of them were unemployed because of the poor economy in Germany. And so they banded together. They were veterans. There was camaraderie there. There was a sense of belonging, a sense of uh, a vision or focus. And so they came together in these groups called the Freikorps, and many of them joined the Nazi Party. Not every single one, but a lot of them did join the Nazi Party. So basically what happened is after the Freikorps members began to join the Nazi Party, they organized and became, the Nazi Party organized them, and they became like the armed squads of the Nazi party. So you had the political side to it, but you also had this kind of military side to it. They weren't, it wasn't the German army or the German military. Uh, that had been uh, reduced to 100,000 uh, soldiers of a standing army for Germany. But these Freikorps members were uh, the armed, meaning they had weapons, uh, arm of the Nazi party. So under the leadership of Ernst Röhm, which that'll come in, he'll come in um, back into the picture here uh, with the Knight of the Long Knives. But Ernst Röhm was their leader, and they were organized under the Sturmabteilung, or the SA, is what they were called. Now they were also called the Brown Shirts because that's what they wore. They wore these. They all wore the same color uh, shirt, type of shirt called the Brown Shirts, and. The, the SA was the armed squads of the Nazi party. Hitler used them to guard party meetings. When Hitler joined the, joined the, uh, the workers' party before it became the Nazis, the party was weak, it was disorganized, it lacked focus, and its leadership was divided. He was in charge of the propaganda. It morphed into the Nazi party. And during this time, it was seen that Hitler was very popular, popular with what he said. And he spoke well. He put his ideas out there, and people bought into them easily and listened to him. And so he became very popular. July, 20, July of 1921, Hitler became the leader of the Nazi party. So he went from just being a member of the German Workers' Party to being in charge of their propaganda. It turns into the Nazi Party, and then he becomes the leader of the Nazi Party by 1921. So in two years, he's now the leader of the Nazi Party. Here's a picture of a, a Freikorps. Uh, notice the World War I uniforms that they had. Now, the, this, this is not the brown shirts yet. This is an actual group of Freikorps members. But they have World War I uniforms on with the wrapped leggings. That's called, they're called putis, the wrapped leggings. Uh, notice they have their grenades. These are German-style grenades hanging from the belt, obviously weapons. They still have their helmets. You have this armored car back here. So this is uh, a Freikorps. So this is who would then join the party. They would bring all these weapons with them because they're, they're, it was their own collection. And then the Nazis would use them as an armed part of the political party. And they would, they would basically be morphed into or turned, when they joined the party, they would be um, put into SA units or brown shirts. Here's Ernst Rahm on the left. He was the leader of the SA. Um, this is the brown shirt that he's wearing here. And you can see it over here is a colorized uh, 
I don't know if there's a postcard or a colorized photo, but you can see that they're on parade here. Okay, just continuing on, Hitler as early Nazi party leader. So now he's the leader of the Nazi party. He immediately set out for a mass movement. He wanted to get as many people to join as he could, and uh, he really wanted to expand further than Bavaria, but uh, further than Munich and definitely into more parts of Bavaria, but he just he wasn't that powerful yet. So he set up this mass movement. He used the party newspaper to spread ideas which were popular among the Bavarians. Now, the Nazi party bought a newspaper and press in 1920. So as their own, they owned it. And so they could put out as much information and pamphlets and everything that they wanted to put out, newspapers, um, as, the, as much as they wanted, as long as they had money to pay for it. And they would have these uh, kind of campaign drives to raise money. So the Bavarians... Um, listen to these ideas. And so through a massive propaganda push, um, he swayed many people to the Nazi cause. And it grew from a handful of people at meetings. So they would, you know, they would have uh, political meetings in uh, Munich or other parts of Bavaria, and they would be you know, um, saying their Nazi ideology, their political thoughts. And at first it was just a handful of people, but then it grew and grew and grew, and many people began to join the Nazi party, and it became thousands at each of these meetings. The party membership grew immensely, and the reason was what you is because you had a charismatic leader who was Hitler. He could speak well. He got people's attention, uh, his gestures, his voice, and he had a plan. Remember, Germany was going through a very difficult time with their economy. There were people unemployed. People couldn't eat. There was all kinds of political uh, turmoil going on, P establishment of the Weimar government, and they would, they would have to cancel the elected officials and hold more elections, and then those elections would have to go away and have more elections, and, and the, governments were, the government was just really struggling. But on scene comes Adolf Hitler, a charismatic leader, and he's out there with a plan. Popular ideas that the people listened to was that Jews were to blame for, the, for Germany's problems. So again, if you are sitting in a country that is struggling with all of these different things, you want to blame somebody. The country needs to blame somebody. So you have Hitler spewing that the Jews are to blame. And again, he got his anti-Semitism from his days when he was a young man before the war in, in Austria. He would um, spew out his ideas on the Weimar government. And, ha and again, Bavaria hated this government, so he would, he would hammer at that government. He uh, denounced Marxism and socialist ideals. Again, this is a right-wing, uh, far right-wing political party. And Bavaria had other political parties in it, but they would they would be, uh, fight against the, the the Nazi Party would fight against these communist parties and the socialist parties and and even the Catholic Center Party they would they would uh, fight against them. So he was denouncing Marxism and social uh, socialist ideals, and that became more and more popular. And so Hitler decides he's going to act. He's basically tired of being stuck with just a, uh, a center in Munich and Bavaria, and he wanted uh, to basically to seize power. And so what he does is he holds a coup. And this is called the Beer Hall Putsch of 1923. And basically it's a coup. Because of his rapid growth and support, Hitler attempts to seize power in Bavaria. Now that's the state, the state of Bavaria, by staging a coup in Munich, which is the capital city of Bavaria. And that's where the Nazis were, were basically headquartered. And what he does is he gets General Erich Ludendorff, who was a World War I hero, he gets him to agree with the right-wing ideas, and they both decide, they come up with a plan, that they're going to take control of the Bavarian government and... Hitler believes that since Erich Ludendorff is on his side, then the military, the police and the military units, which are part of the government, that they will uh, fall in line and get behind Erich Ludendorff, General Ludendorff. And with the local Bavarian 
um, military units and police behind him, they can then take over Bavaria and then even go further than that and try to take over uh, Germany by taking down the Weimar government. The reason he decided to do this was uh, he ins- he was inspired by Mussolini's march on Rome a year earlier. If you remember the, that PowerPoint when Mussolini marched on Rome with his black shirts and uh, took over Rome, well, Hitler decides he's going to do the same thing. And he's going to plan a march from a beer hall through Munich and basically take control of Munich, which then in turn would take control of Bavaria and then in turn try to take control of the Weimar government and topple it. On November 9th, 1923, Gustav von Kahr, who is the Bavarian state commissioner, he's kind of like he's kind of like the governor of the state, was giving a speech to 3,000 people in a large beer hall. And there were other Bavarian government leaders present. And so Hitler decides this is where he's going to do it. He's going to have the SA brown shirts surround the beer hall. And so that's what they do. There's 3,000 people in this beer hall listening to Carr speak. The brown shirts surround the beer hall. The, some SA, armed SA people come in. Uh, soldiers, I'll say. SA soldiers, brown shirt soldiers come in with Hitler. And Hitler begins to speak. But he could not be heard over the noise of the crowd because the crowd was you know, loud. All of a sudden, all these SA people come in and, and disrupted the meeting. And so the crowd was talking and crowd was getting kind of loud. So Hitler takes his pistol and he fires a shot into the ceiling of the beer hall. That got everyone's attention. So he announced that the coup has started and he stated that nobody could leave the beer hall. So what happens is Hitler decides to take a large group of SA and Nazis and spearheaded by Ludendorff, he was going to march through the city. So they leave the beer hall with this group. And what happens is, basically, he said no one could leave, but he didn't leave enough people to uh, to guard the place. And so some people started leaving, and they started they started contacting the, the Bavarian police that this is happening. So basically, Hitler is off marching through the city, and the authorities are now notified. So as Hitler's marching through the city with his large group of Nazis and is spearheaded by General Ludendorff, the World War I hero, the Bavarian police are called and they block the Nazi march at the Central Square. And it's unclear who fired the first shots, but there there, there was a short battle in the street, and when the melee kind of dispersed, 20 Nazis were killed and four Bavarian police officers were killed. Uh, Hitler was injured as he he was actually, um, he fell against the curb and it was injured, but he was whisked away and he escaped. Uh, But he was arrested later on to go to trial. Another important Nazi that was injured, he was actually shot, was um, Hermann Goring, who becomes the leader, basically he becomes second in command in the Nazi state, and he was the leader of the Luftwaffe in World War II. And we actually looked at a picture of him during World War I. Uh, he was a World War I flying ace. Uh, oh, a hero of World War I was Hermann Goring. Well, he was actually shot. Uh, he survived, obviously, because he becomes the leader of the Luftwaffe. But uh, he was taken away to be to heal. To, to, he actually had an operation. Hitler would later, when he is dictator... Uh, he would lay a wreath on the graves of these Nazis that were killed during the putsch, and he he held he held the the people that were killed and injured, and even those that that fought during the putsch. Uh, he held them with great esteem. Hitler looked at them as like the like the core of of the Nazi belief, and they 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 went all the way for the Nazi belief. Uh, Hitler was placed on trial for treason. He took advantage of the press and also being on the stand in the courtroom to preach preach his Nazi ideology and denounce the Weimar government. So even while on trial, he still was out there just, just spewing his beliefs. He never denied the charges of treason. 
Uh, he basically said that it was his duty to overthrow uh, the criminals uh, that were in charge. So he portrayed himself as a strong German patriot, which many b people believed. He considered the politicians in charge as those that stabbed Germany in the back with the um, loss of the war and with the way the government was going. Uh, basically, he was blaming the politicians. Jews and politicians is who he blamed. He declared that Germ the German army did not lose the war, but it was undermined uh, by treachery at home. During the trial, he had a lot of public support, and the publicity uh, actually helped Hitler because it took his name across Germany, not just Bavaria. So even though the putsch did not take... Uh, Hitler to where he took control of the Germany or, or uh, take the government down, his name did go out across Germany. So people began to hear his name and, and uh, they were following this trial. The trial was, I believe the trial was 19 days long and it uh, took his name across Germany for 19 days and, and he would, it would be printed in the newspaper what he was saying. So people started to listen to this and like, they, they liked what he was saying. The people loved him and even some of the judges that were on the panel. He was in front of uh, several judges. Uh, some of the judges um, began to even have sympathy for what he was saying. One judge on the panel actually said he should be acquitted for the treason charge, uh, but he was not. He was sentenced to a lenient five years in prison, and during this time in prison, he was able to have daily visitors he could have his own private secretary in the prison, and that man's name was Rudolf Hess, who he would become a pretty prevalent Nazi himself later on. And during this uh, prison sentence, he wrote his book, Mein Kampf, which means my struggle. Now, Mein Kampf was written, and notice he only served nine months of the five-year sentence. I mean, he didn't even serve a, a one year. He served nine months, and during that nine months, he wrote Mein Kampf. Uh, other Nazis got light sentences. Uh, Ludendorff wasn't sentenced at all. He was acquitted because of being a World War I hero. And what this did, this whole fiasco of the Beer Hall Putsch, the trial, and the imprisonment and all of that, what that taught Hitler was something very important, that his power must come by legal means. And so Hitler's, Hitler will be released from prison after nine months, and from that moment on, Everything that Hitler did was legal, and that's very important. Everything he did from the release from prison and on, he gained his power legally, being voted in and laws being passed and everything. Everything he did was legal. Here's a picture of the defendants at the Beer Hall Putsch trial. You see Hitler there right here um, with his, obviously, there's his mustache. So here's Hitler, and then this is Ludendorff. Here's Hitler in his cell at Landsberg Prison. Uh, he's wearing the traditional Lederhosen, which is a German, like a German traditional uh, suit or suspenders that they would wear with these short pants. Um, but you can see, you know, he's got a table, he's got tea, uh, he's reading the newspaper, a little decoration on the wall. I mean, he's not in some kind of like prison outfit and he's wearing the the uh, tie and all that here's people visiting him that's Rudolf Hess right here on the right but other visitors again you know it's it, it's not a very hard uh, hard prison life he's there for nine months and he wrote Mein Kampf here's a picture of uh, the book cover of Mein Kampf 1925 autobiographical book written by Adolf Hitler while in prison and it was written in nine months it's a very poorly written book. Uh, I've, I've read Mein Kampf. Um, a lot of it is, is rambling. Uh, it's not well written at all. He's not a writer, uh, but he wrote this. He outlined his political and racial ideas in the book. He goes into intricate detail, a lot, a lot of detail in this book, and he outlines his blueprint for the future. This was written in 1925, and what he says he will do, he actually does when he gets into power, especially with the racial ideas and political ideas. And I mean, he, he, he wrote it in Mein Kampf. It's just people didn't, people didn't read it. People didn't believe it. The, the, the 
authorities in later governments, such as Great Britain and the United States, they didn't believe him, basically. And France, they didn't believe him. Uh, but it was actually put in print in 1925 what he would do. It became the Bible for Nazism. And so by 1939, there were 5.2 million copies sold. Okay, so post-prison. After his release, uh, Hitler spent several years rebuilding the Nazi party after the failed Beer Hall Putsch. Now, the Nazi party was actually outlawed after the Putsch, but that didn't matter. The Nazis, they still came together, and Hitler began rebuilding the party. It was slow progress because of Germany's economy uh, beginning to do slightly better. Okay, this is before the, the, the Great Depression. Okay, so the economy was doing a little bit better, and so the, the need to rejoin the party, people kind of just put that off a little bit. They didn't, they didn't all jump back on the party bandwagon. It was uh, kind of slow progress. But that all changed when the stock market crashed in 1929. Okay, so from 1924 to 1929, things really changed. And you can see there the Nazi votes for the Reichstag. I have them listed there. Now, the Reichstag was uh, kind of like the, the Congress of Germany. Um, the Reichstag had different parties in it, like, like we have in our Congress where we have Democrats and, and Republicans and Independents and all of that in our, in our government. Uh, the Reichstag had the same thing. And so the Nazis would put people forward uh, for vote to be voted into the Reichstag. Uh, so in 1928, there were 810,000 uh, votes for the party members. So just a f few party members in, in the Reichstag. But then it started to increase. After the stock market crash in 1929, the Great Depression kind of set in. It's definitely in the United States, but also across the world. 1930, look at the votes. 6.4 million people voted, uh, Nazis voted, to put people uh, in the Reichstag. 1933, they went up to 17.2 million people voted for the Nazi candidates. And so, in 1933... The majority of the Reichstag seats belonged to the Nazis, and they were voted in. So that means they controlled the government. They didn't. It wasn't all the seats were Nazis yet, because there were still political parties that were in, involved in the government, other political parties, and so they got votes. But the point is, in 1933, the majority was of the Reichstag were Nazis, and then obviously after Hitler becomes the Führer. Uh, there are no other political parties. All political parties are outlawed after he becomes um, the leader. And so the, uh, the Nazis would basically just have a dictatorship then. But in 1933, the Nazis took control of the government. And it was all legal. But let's just back up one year. In 1932, Hitler ran against the 84-year-old General Paul Hindenburg. Okay, he was another World War I hero. He was 84 years old, and Hitler ran against him for the presidency of Germany. Okay? So, uh, in this election, Hitler does turn up a little bit short. And basically the reason is, is because you have a general of World War I who was a hero, Hindenburg, going against Hitler who was a corporal. And Hitler lost the bid for the presidency. But in the negotiations, because the Nazis controlled almost all of the seats in the Reichstag, which they didn't yet, but they almost controlled all the seats in the Reichstag, they negotiated that Hitler would be appointed chancellor. Okay, so Hitler loses the presidency, so now we have President Paul Hindenburg as president of Germany, but... Under him is the chancellor, and he's appointed chancellor. Hitler is appointed chancellor in 1932. All of this is legal. So here's Chancellor Hitler. He's bowing down to President Hindenburg. So here's Hindenburg, and here's Hitler shaking his hand. But 
Hitler is not going to stay chancellor. He is going to move up into basically a dictatorship. And this is how it happens. The government passed the Enabling Act, which would give Hitler dictatorial powers. And this act was enacted, the Enabling Act was enacted after the Reichstag fire. The building that the government met in is called the Reichstag. The body itself is called the Reichstag, but they also meet in the building, and the building is called the Reichstag. It's kind of like our Capitol building in the United States. Well, this, this um, it was a big, big building, big stone building. Uh, it, it catches on fire, and they blame the communists. That Some communists went in and burned it down. But what happened was, because of this fire, they enact the Enabling Act and, an Act, and it allowed Hitler and his cabinet to enact laws without the approval of the rest of the Reichstag. And that's very important. That means Hitler can now just make, make law. One of the first acts that he did was to outlaw communists and other political opponents because they blame the communists for the fire. And so they, one of the first things he does, he outlaws all other political opponents. Right on the heels of this, and this, is, this happened in 1933, right on the heels of this, Hindenburg dies in 1934. And so you have Chancellor Hitler. Now there's no president because he died. So upon Hindenburg's death, the Enabling Act stated that the Chancellor the office of chancellor and the office of president would be merged into one office called the Führer or the leader. Okay, so this all happens very quickly and it's all legal. And so you have Hitler going from losing the presidency to becoming chancellor, the president dying, the chancellor and presidency merging into one office called the Fuhrer, and all other political opponents are outlawed. That is how the Nazis came to power into a dictatorship, and it was all 100% legal. June 30th to July 2nd, 1934, an event takes place called the Night of the Long Knives. And this is an event that occurs that secures total power for Hitler, and basically from this part, part, point on, there is he's never challenged again. This is how it happens. As part of his securing of total power, Hitler orders the execution of any dissidents within the Nazi party, called Night of the Long Knives. And basically what happens, a long list is written up that these people are political opponents and that their, their ideas against the Nazis who are now in total control is equal to treason. And the penalty for treason is death. And so they write up this long list of people that need to be exterminated. And that's what happens. Uh, some within the party and many within the SA leadership wanted a Nazi party with the military as the center. Instead of a political center of Nazism, which that's what Hitler was. He was a, you know, he was a political uh, persona. They wanted it to be basically a military party. And Hitler didn't want it to be a military party. He wanted it to be a political party with a military power. And so uh, many people looked, many people that wanted the military center, they looked to Ernst Rahm as their leader. And that was not going to sit well with, with Hitler. And so on the night of the long knives, 700 to 1,000 Nazis were executed by Nazis. They were, they were basically deemed as treasonous, and they, um, they were executed. Uh, Hitler didn't forget Gustav von Kahr. So you remember him? Remember von Kahr, who was in that meeting in the beer hall, uh, who basically um, left to go notify the authorities that the putsch was uh, occurring and that there was a march going through Munich? Uh, Hitler didn't forget him, and he ended up being killed, executed, in uh, 1934. Ernst Rahm was arrested. Uh, he was given a pistol in, a, in the jail cell to kill himself. Uh, the, basically what happened was he was put in a jail cell. Uh, some Nazis came in, gave him a pistol, and said, you need to do your duty and, and kill yourself, and they walked out. 
After a few minutes, they did not hear a shot in the sh- in the cell, and so they they walked back in and they they shot him in the cell. So he was killed, and this act consolidated Hitler's power, and it would never be challenged again. So I just want to make sure you understand that the Nazi Party is a political party that would then have control of the military. The reason the Night of the Long Knives takes place is because there were people within the Nazi party who wanted it to be a military party, a military-centered party. And uh, that's not what Hitler envisioned, and so they, they, they were looked at as treasonous, so they were killed. Okay, so we're, before we get um, back to, to Hitler, um, he basically become uh, is in charge now of Nazi Germany. 1933, he's in charge of Nazi Germany as Chancellor, and then he becomes the Führer and all of that uh, in 1934 when the president dies. Um, we'll get back to that, but we're going to stop there for a second, and we're going to switch gears and look at Nazi society. And this is uh, this fascinates me. I love to research this and study this and read about it. Is that how could you take... Uh, basically an entire country and shift their ideology to Nazi ideology. And there were several ways they did it, Um, obviously through people believing it, and and many did. Many believed it. So millions of people joined the Nazi party because they believed it. But then there was also ideas of race and uh, other things such as the youth groups that they had and all of that, the education in schools, to kind of indoctrinate people into Nazi ideology. And one of the uh, things that they did was to um, give their racist ideology in, in the schools. And really what it is, it's, it's raising the, the German children to believe Nazi ideology, especially on race. So racist ideology... Identif- identified the Aryan race as the superior race. That is what the, the Nazis believed, and that's what they they uh, would say and speak. They looked at the Jews as parasites on society, and this was taught in schools. Now, on the right-hand side of your screen is a book, and this was a children's book. It was a book in elementary schools, and it would be a book in the homes of Nazis that would have uh, children of this age. And this was a very popular book in regards to the racism that was being uh, spread around in Nazi Germany. It was called The Poisonous Mushroom. And again, this is a very Im- important book. It's a children's book, and you can just see on the picture there, there's the poisonous mushroom. And so obviously if you eat the poisonous mushroom, you're going to die. But you can see there's these mushrooms that they they look like Jews. The long hook nose, the big ears, kind of almost like kind of grotesque looking features. And you can just see the Star of David there on the chest of this, this mushroom here. Okay, And this would be read to children and taught to children. And the, the book was basically, each page in the book had a drawing and then a little story to go along with the page. And it was to um, make the, the Jew look and be grotesque and guilty and nasty. And so on the left, and there are many different pages, this is just two that I took for this PowerPoint, but you, you see how it's portrayed and this would be taught to children. You have you have the little little German children here, you know, innocent children, and they're out for a walk. He has a little stick, she has her little dolly, and you know, just innocent children, you know, blonde hair, German child, you know, and they're and they're they're inquisitive little children. But then you have this this big fat kind of nasty looking Jew. He's drawn here in a stereotypical Jewish drawing. Big hook nose. He's got he's behind these like dark sunglasses, big lip. It almost looks kind of like mischievous, mean, kind of mischievous. And he's got in his hand the candy. And he's giving the candy to the to the child. 
And so the idea here is that he's going to take these children and go do something to them that's very nasty. Okay, And so it's a warning for the German children, don't go near this Jewish man who's handing out the candy. Jews are bad, Jews are evil, Jews are going to do bad things to you, and so you stay away from the Jew. And it's just basically making a stereotypical judgment on the Jews. Then you come over here to this one, and this is um, in, in the doctor's office. And you see here is the waiting room of the doctor's office. And again, uh, now instead of a child, now you have a, a German like teenager, okay? Because she's a little bit more mature. And again, the blonde hair. She probably has blue eyes. I don't know, but the blonde hair, dressed nicely. A uh, German girl at the doctor's office in the waiting room, and the door opens. And behind the door is a dark office back here, a dark exam room. And the door opens, and behind the door is this Jewish doctor in his coat. And he's got, again, kind of like the same glasses and a mischievous smile on his face underneath of his big hook nose. Kind of ugly, grotesque looking. And he's about to call this young German teenager, young lady, back into this dark office. And, and the, the story is that he's going to do nasty things to her. This was taught in the schools. This was taught in the homes. This book was read to the children. And so they, this racist ideology is indoctrinated into the, the children's minds against the Jews. And so as, as time goes by, again, the Holocaust didn't start until uh, 1941, basically, was when the Holocaust with the, the death camps and the burning of gassing and burning of Jews, that didn't start until later on. But during the uh, Nazi years of 1933 to 1939, many, many Jews were persecuted and the racist ideology was permeating the society of Nazi Germany, especially after 1935 with the race laws of 1935. Okay, um, the next thing I want to talk to you about with Nazi society is this idea. It's called Lebensraum. And Lebensraum, it literally means in German, living space. And Lebensraum was this idea that Hitler had, and he believed, that the future of Germany was the expansion of territory to the east. So the, the area of Poland, the area of Russia, the area of Czechoslovakia, um, Yugoslavia, the, that area, even into Ukraine, um, that this land would be perfect for living space. So with this, uh, this, this idea or focus of German expansion, you would need land for Germans to go and settle. And basically it's the lands of the Slavs, the Poles, and the Russians. And basically the Lebensraum was this plan to repopulate or resettle these areas after Germany takes over these areas, resettle them into um, German areas by uh, planting German families on the on the land on the farms, and that was kind of the ideal. Was this this uh, German family farmer? You're connected to the land. You raised your crops. It was this uh, kind of grassroots idea that the loyal Nazi family will will plant themselves on some conquered land. And they would have this space, this living space, to um, produce for the German Reich. And so this is a propaganda poster on the right um, where you have this, again, a German woman, blondish hair. It's, it's neatly kept. She's working the land. She has the, the wheat in her hand and waving to the, to the wagon that's going to be going off to the market, all for, again, the German Reich. So that was called Lebensraum, and that would be uh, come into play after Germany begins to conquer these areas, especially when they get further into Russia, conquering into Russia. Uh, Germany starts to set up a structured government of these different conquered lands, especially Poland, and they set up a kind of a government, a structure, and they start moving Germans into Poland to, uh, to populate and to settle uh, the land. Uh, propaganda was very big 
during this time, and this was led by the Minister of Propaganda, Joseph Goebbels. There's a picture of him. What's interesting about Joseph Goebbels is that he had a club foot. And so if you're talking about some kind of uh, perfect race or some kind of a superior race, uh, German Goebbels was about as ugly as you could get. He was a, sh a sh short, skinny, mouse, mousy kind of looking man with a club foot. He walked with a bad limp. Uh, but he was in charge of the propaganda for the Nazi, uh, for Nazism. And he would actually kill himself and his family with Hitler in the bunker in 1945. So he was very loyal to Hitler, and he, but he was also a very gifted speaker and minister of propaganda. He did a really good job at swaying the masses to believe the Nazi ideology and to join Nazism. Here's three posters that were used. These are propaganda posters. And again, if you're a German in Nazi Germany, these are the posters that you would see on the street and pasted on boards and everything. And you would see these German families. And so you would, you would want to be a good German. All other political parties are outlawed. So you, as, as the father of the family, you see in these two posters these strong men, blonde hair, kind of chiseled looks. And you being, uh, you, you know, you've joined the Nazi party because all the rest are outlawed. So you being the good Nazi father, you're going to raise your good Nazi family. And you're going to produce many children. Here's mom. Here's the mother. at producing these good Nazis, uh, excuse me, good German children who are going to grow up to be Nazis. This one here is already being indoctrinated in the Hitler Youth. That's the Hitler Youth uniform. And so... Uh, the the Germans would look at these and they would want to do their part. They would want to be part of this movement, the Nazi movement. It was very popular. And so that's how, that's how Hitler was able to sway millions of people to his side and to become good, good uh, German Nazis was through propaganda. Again, doing your part, having the children here. Look at this smiling, this smiling little girl. You know, so she's going to grow up to be a, a good mother in Nazi Germany to have children for the Fuhrer. Over here is this is um, uh, this symbol here was for the German mothers. It was called the League of German Mothers or German Women. Well, that's the symbol. Uh, but again, you see, it's a German mother, she's very loyal. She has her her apron on, and obviously, she's putting the baby down here in the cradle. And you have the other other children that she's had. You know, again, very Aryan, blonde hair, very inquisitive. Okay, so this is the ideal. This is what Nazi families would look like. And so every Nazi family would want to look like this and do their part. And this is basically how the the Nazi society um, looked, and people wanted to do their part. Okay, the next thing I want to talk to you about in Nazi society is flags and uniforms. And I got to say right off the bat is that Nazis loved uniforms and flags and all the regalia that went with it, the the headgear, the the hats, the awards, everything that they had. I mean, the knives, I mean, it was like every group within Nazi society, they had like their own knives and their own uniforms. Everybody knew their place. Um, military and civil entities had it. Specific uniforms with ranks and awards. You even had ranks in the civilian side, the civil side of it. You had ranking a ranking system to it. Uh, and I'll show you some coming up here in, in a second. But uh, it wasn't just the military that had uniforms. It was many different areas within, within civil society had uniforms. They had flags to identify who they were and promote their units within their military and civil um, entities. So it wasn't just the military. And what happened was once the economy started getting better, especially during the 1930s, uh, many men who were out of work before, they had joined the Nazi party, and then they started getting jobs where they, they had a position. They had a uniform. They had a... Um, uh, authority in different areas, even if it was in the, the civil side of it, they would still have 
a ranking and a power. And so it was very attractive to be part. Who, who are you in Nazi society? Are you in the military or are you in the civilian or the civil world? If you're in the civil world, are you somebody of authority there? Are you wearing a uniform? And then if you're, if you, let's say you're not in the military or you're not in the civil service, uh, and you just had a job. Let's say you were a farmer, or you were a butcher, or you were, or you were um, someone else in the in society that would, um, you know, a grocer or something. Someone that would uh, have a have a, just have a job. Uh, you still had a level of respect because everything you did was for the society, the Nazi society. You would be feeding the Nazi society. This system was intricate and uh, specific it was militaristic and authoritarian and it was crucial for government control because you would say how could how could hitler control an entire country well he was dictator and he dictated to his his uh, nazi cabinet and under the cabinet you had the military side of it and that was very large and then you had the civilian side of it, the civil service side of it, and that was very structured. And it filtered all the way down to even to the youth. The, even the youth had like a military-style structure. So it was very easy to control this as a dictator because of the militaristic kind of structure that the entire society took. Okay, so here's some uniforms I just wanted to show you quickly. Um, this is a German army officer at, at his wedding. So you can see his... His uh, blushing bride there, uh, but you can see kind of the the uniform. They loved uniforms and the look of it. Very sharp looking uniforms. They always had their awards on to show who, what they did and who they were. It just gave them respect. Uh, this is a SS. Okay, so this was uh, the SA would continue for a time, but then the SA would then kind of peter out and it'll be more with the SS okay and I don't have time or time to go into this uh, but this is the SS the SS will be in charge of the the concentration camps and the uh, death camps there were there was part of the military called the Waffen SS which was basically the army of the SS that would also fight in battles uh, here's and the German SA, so here's a brown shirt. This is an early, early photograph. This would probably be either late 1920s or early 1930s would be this. This award here, again, remember I said everyone, they, they loved their medals. They loved the regalia that went with it, the awards. This, this uh, where's my cursor? Here it is. This award right here means he was a veteran of World War I. Okay, and then this badge, this is called the wound badge. That means he was wounded in World War I. This, Hitler would wear this. Hitler would wear his wound badge. Okay, so here's some more uniforms. Uh, this is the German HJ, which was the Hitler Youth. The HJ stand means uh, Hitler Jugend, which means Hitler Youth. And this is his uniform. The way you can also tell is that this armband with the stripe and the diamond swastika uh, that that was the Hitler Youth symbol. Okay, so that's a Hitler Youth uniform. Um, over here, this young lady here, this is a, a she's out of the Hitler Youth because the Hitler Youth also had women uh, or, or or girls, uh, but she's out of it because um, she is actually part of a work battalion. RAD is a RAD, the German RAD. This this is a very long word. It's like three words put together really long. It would take like a, a, this entire like bottom of the PowerPoint would be that word. It's called the German Rad. Um, they were work battalions, and it doesn't mean they're out there being slaves. It just means that they um, would join this group because they would want to help rebuild uh, Germany. Basically, in in 1930s, there was a lot of construction projects going on, a lot of organizational structures going on um, to build up Germany. Uh, let me just pause here. We're going to get to it in a little bit, but um, I have to say this, 
that Germany, they had a lot of growth during the 1930s under Hitler's leadership to where they became a very modern nation. And the way they did it was these work battalions. They built the Audubon. Um, again, that wasn't like it wasn't any kind of like slavery or anything or or having like Jews building it. It was actually putting people to work to help society get a, a better footing after the disastrous stock market crash and depression. And so you had these these units that would be working on civil projects, construction projects, um, so, uh, social projects. And so she wouldn't be out there like building the Audubon, but she would maybe be in some sort of an organizational role. Uh, this was the symbol for RAD. It was the swastika with these two wheat heads underneath of it in a V shape. Okay, so I just wanted to kind of clarify that. But again, uh, um, that was the uniform. Here's a German mailman. Again, this is a civil servant. And he's wearing a uniform has a ranking, this thing on his collar here, that's his ranking, uh, you know, has a, a headgear with this nice cap. So this was the, the German mailman. So even in the civil service side of it, you had a uniform and a ranking system. Here's flags, very important to the Nazi society. Uh, everywhere you went, you saw the Nazi flags. So this was the Nazi standard. This is where you, what you would see all the time in society. Uh, hanging from poles, hanging from buildings, people waving flags at parades. This is what you saw. But then there was also the military side of it. This was the Kriegsmarine flag, which is the Navy. Uh, this is the Luftwaffe flag, which is the Air Force. This was Hitler's personal standard. No matter where, wherever Hitler was at, this was the flag that was flying. Uh, this is the SS flag. Hitler Youth flag. So again, flags were very important. Okay, so let's talk about the swastika for a second. Uh, the swastika today is a symbol of offense, a uh, symbol of racism, symbol of hatred. Uh, but it was not that uh, to start off with. It was it, the swastika is actually an ancient symbol, and before it, it was around a long time before Hitler made it his symbol. Hitler did not make the swastika. It was around for a long time. And the symbol actually meant, the ancient symbol actually meant good fortune. And Hitler used this symbol with great effect. He actually describes this, his flag and the symbol, the swastika symbol, in Mein Kampf, which again was published in 1925. But he used the swastika as a, a great propaganda tool. Everything of Nazism had the swastika on it. Everything did. And what it did is it elicited a sense of pride and nationalism. If, if you were a good Nazi, you would wear your Nazi pin, and you would wear your Nazi pin everywhere. If you were a Nazi member uh, of the Nazi party, you would wear your party pin everywhere. Everywhere. You would wear it on your tie, or you would wear it on your suit lapel, or you would wear it on your dress lapel. You would wear it everywhere if you were a Nazi party member because you wanted to show your loyalty to Nazism. Actually, uh, let me go back to the uniforms. Uh, this right here, this pin in the center of his tie, that is a Nazi party pin. That means that he was a sworn Nazi party member. So he joined the Nazi political party. It would basically kind of kind of like if you're a Republican or a Democrat, you, if you joined the Republican Party in the United States, it would be like that if they gave you like some kind of like Republican elephant pin or something and you would put it on to walk around saying that you're part of the Republican Party. That's what the Nazis did. And these, these uh, pins were actually numbered so whatever your party number was, each person got their own party number, it would be on imprinted on the back of the pin. And then you would walk around wearing it as a proud Nazi. Obviously, since the Third Reich, the swastika has come to represent hatred and racism, uh, racial purity, uh, definitely, which is used by neo-Nazis today. Uh, so here is, you can just see the importance of flags, the importance of the swastika, Okay, 
and uh, up here is Hitler's standard, personal standard. And this picture here that's taken is actually at a uh, rally in Nuremberg, Germany. They would have these big rallies. And this rally is up where the stage is, where the speakers would be. Right here is Joseph Goebbels. Remember that minister of propaganda, that ugly guy, the real shrimpy, kind of mousy, skinny guy, Goebbels? That's him. And what he's about to do is he's about to introduce Hitler to come up on stage and speak. And the audience that's watching, you know, they're off the screen here, the audience is thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people. And I have a picture later on of that. But you can see this is Hitler's standard, which means that's where Hitler is. So flags, swastika, very important to the Nazis. And it brought this sense of loyalty. It brought this sense of belonging and nationalism. So every every loyal Nazi would wear their loyal or would wear their Nazi pin on their lapel or on their tie, and that would be saying, I'm a I'm a Nazi member. And there were millions of people that joined the Nazi party. Okay, we're going to talk about the Hitler Youth to finish up this PowerPoint. Uh, the Hitler Youth, it was a logical extension of Hitler's belief for the German future. It was viewed as important as school. So again, kind of think about the Boy Scouts in the United States. The Hitler Youth were like a militarized Boy Scout, and they were indoctrinated with Nazi ideology and racial ideology. It was viewed as important at school. So, you know, we say, you know, kids have to go to school. Well, in Nazi Germany, kids had to go to Hitler Youth meetings. That's the way it was. In 1933, there were 100,000 members of the Hitler Youth. And at that time, remember, the, when Hitler came to power with the Enabling Act, all other political groups were, uh, the Enabling Act made all other political groups illegal. Well, the same thing with other youth organizations. You had communist political uh, youth organizations and other organizations like that. Well, they were all abolished. And so those kids had to either join the um, Hitler Youth or they got persecuted. In 1936, you had 4 million members. And in 1936, they added compulsory attendance, which means every, you had to do it. It was mandatory that all youth belonged to a local Hitler Youth unit. 1940, you had 8 million members in the Hitler Youth. The Hitler Youth were for 10-year-olds to 18-year-olds, boys and girls. We're going to break it down here in the next slide. But it was 10 to 18-year-old boys and girls. It was to prepare boys for war. Basically, it's pre prepare boys either to go fight in a war or to be part of the Nazi government. The, some some part of the Nazi government structure. And for the girls, it was to prepare them for motherhood and civil or support activities. Okay? Uh, it was very structured. It was very militaristic. There was a ranking system to it. it they were trained and indoctrinated in Nazi ideology and activities. The final bullet point there on the slide is that they are pushed into service at the end of the war. And what that means is, especially for the young men, the boys, uh, they were actually pushed into the military to go fight. So you had, you had basically, you had 14, 15 year old boys fighting on the front lines, especially in Berlin. When the Russians were moving into Berlin in 1945, they had Hitler Youth boys out there uh, fighting the war. Okay, so for the boys, it's broken down this way. There's the DJ, which is the Deutsches Jungvolk, or the German youngsters, and that was the 10 to 14-year-olds. And then you had the HJ, which were the Hitler Jugend, or the Hitler Youth, which were the 14 to 18-year-olds. And both of these groups, the DJ and the HJ, would be involved in outdoor activities, parades, and sports. It was just a higher level of this with the older, the older group, the actual, the HJ. Uh, most activities aligned with um, military organizational training. They would have some kind of focus on this. So if the, if the boy 
uh, wanted to focus on the Army or the Air Force or the Navy or science, agriculture, communications, driving, they would be put in these kind of units and they would be trained in that. So, for example, the Air Force, remember the Air Force was limited by the Treaty of Versailles, so uh, Germany didn't have have a big air force. There, there was no air force. And so to get around that, the Hitler Youth, especially the early years of the Hitler Youth, which was in the 1920s, the Hitler, the, the Hitler Youth um, organization was developed in the 1920s. Okay, So don't think it came into being in 1933. It was before that. Okay, But they... Uh, they couldn't have like an air force. They couldn't go train on planes because there were no planes. And so the way they got around it was they got they trained on gliders. And once the uh, German air force began to be built up again during the 1930s to prepare for the war, uh, many of these Hitler youth that were in the air force training of the Hitler youth would become pilots in the Luftwaffe to fight, especially like in the Battle of Britain, with the bombing of Great Britain. So. You have uh, the Hitler Youth here doing these different activities. Uh, here's two propaganda posters. Again, you know what boy wouldn't want to do this? You know you have camaraderie here with the other boys. You get your own uniform. Uh, this is the Hitler Youth knife, and that was that was like very important to the Hitler Youth. When you test, you, you would do these different tests to be in the you know a, a good qualified Hitler Youth you would get your Hitler Youth knife, and this was very important to have. If you had that hanging from your belt, I mean, you were you were top-notch Hitler Youth. Okay, but again, what, what boy in Nazi Germany, you know, wouldn't want to do this? And then, as I said, uh, later on, it became compulsory. They had to join it. Here is another propaganda poster of a Hitler Youth, and, and he's looking forward to... It's kind of like, if I join the Hitler Youth later on, I can be part of the SS. So this poster would be later on, a later later years, maybe 1940s, uh, 1940, 1941. Um, you would see this kind of poster that the Hitler Youth would turn into, go on to serve into the SS. Okay, here's some more pictures. Uh, here's a picture of Hitler with the Hitler Youth. Okay. So there's Hitler. There's Hitler. He's there. He's wearing his Iron Cross, and also there's his wound badge, and there's Hitler's party pin. So very important to Hitler that he wore those. He would always wear these. This would be in, on his uniform a lot. But you see the uniforms of the Hitler Youth. Here's some Hitler Youth out on parade. Um, again, wearing a uniform, carrying flags. Uh, here's some kids at a, a rally. They're yelling something. Again, uniform. But here you have um, some Hitler youth being trained on the use of a rifle. Here's a Hitler youth that's training on a model airplane. So this is one that would be in one of those aviation units of the Hitler youth. And then, like I said, during, this, is, this picture here is during it's probably 1945, so the very last year that Nazi Germany even existed. But you have this Hitler youth. I mean, this is a boy. And he's getting a medal because he was fighting probably the Russians. But, I mean, look at the size of his helmet on him. He's just You can just tell it's a boy, and he's getting an award because he's fighting the Russians. So they're pushed into service. The girls, okay, the girls were also broken up into age groups. You had the JM, the BDM, and the BDM Wirtglob und Schonheit. And the JM was the Jung Model Bund. Okay, and what that means is Jung is youth, uh, Model is is girl, think a maid, like maiden, a Model, and Bund is league. So Jung Model Bund, or Young Girls League, is the 10 to 14 year olds. Then you had the BDM, and this was the largest group, the BDM, was the Bund Deutscher Model, or the League of German Girls. And that was the 14 to 18 years old. But then you also had the BDM Werk, Glob und Schonheit, which was the League of German Girls Faith and Beauty Society. Okay, and the 10 to 14 and 14 to 18 year olds, that's the JM and BDM, 
uh, that was like the main group for the Hitler Youth Girls, and and uh, that would become compulsory. They would have they would have to join that. Uh, but the last group, the BDM Verklob und Schönheit, was voluntary for 17 to 21 year olds, and that was a heavy focus on marriage and motherhood, because what basically what happened was. Uh, this group of girls, the 17, 21 year olds, they would uh, basically be be linked, especially um, just before World War II, they would be partnered up with SS men, and they would be basically having babies with SS men. And the reason is, is that to be in the SS, you had to prove your pure Aryan blood. And so to make this this um, pure race, the SS men would be hooked up with these uh, BDM girls, BDM Verglob und Schonheit girls, and they would um, basically have babies to create a perfect race. And in the one little video clip I have that's in this session, uh, for this session, uh, there's actually a short little section in the video clip showing these young ladies in a young mother's home with all these babies. Many of the those that belong to the Faith and Beauty Society, they would live in a young mother's home. But the reason that you had this girl's part for the Nazi, uh, for the Hitler Youth, was to groom them for marriage, for domestic life, and for future career goals. And the future career goals would be in some kind of a support um, job for the uh, the Nazi government, the Nazi machine, something like that. They would they would work in that. Okay, here's some pictures for the for the BDM. So you have a propaganda poster here. Again, you know this is the the blonde hair, blue eyes. This is the German uh, the Hitler Youth uh, flag here. Um, this is their pin. That little diamond pin but again you have these ladies here young ladies here learning to sew with a picture of hitler on the wall here's some medical training going on uh here's some exercising going on here again here's some bdm and they're taking care of little babies children so they would be being trained to take care of children and here's a last picture i have here this would be a picture of uh, of a, this would be a brother and sister. The one is in the DJ. This is this symbol here. This one rune S is for the the DJ, the young the younger kids. And then here's a, a Hitler Youth girl in um, in her unit. But again, you can see it's the diamond here. They're wearing a uniform. You know, it's just. This would be a portrait of two children who belong to a good German family who belong to the Nazi party. And that is what Hitler wanted. And basically, if you get the youth, then you get the future. And that's what he did. Okay, so this is um, the end of uh, part one of the class. That's it for today. Next time, we're going to be looking at Rise of the Nazis, part two. I'll see you then. Thank you.